Um, so, Galatians chapter 6, so I'm not going to be preaching on 2 Corinthians today. I thought it was probably adequate that I would cover a topic about what our church, uh, new church name is, New Life, uh, new Life Baptist Church. I like it. I like the sound of it, New Life Baptist Church. Like I said, I wouldn't have come up with it myself. I was thinking of Assurance Baptist Church or Deliverance Baptist Church, something like that, just like a one name. I really like what, what we've come up with. So, uh, good job, everyone. Uh, but look, if you look there at verse number 15... For in Christ, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. What do we, when we talk about circumcision, we talk about circumcision of the Jews, that's a showing of the flesh. Now, God did ask the Old Testament Jews to circumcise themselves, right? That would be a mark that they would be the people of God, okay? But it's not the fleshly. Now, in the New Testament, what marks us as the people of God is not that circumcision. It's not the outward flesh. That was just a picture of the new creature that it says there, but a new creature. I'll just read the whole thing again, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Or we can say it this way, but a new life. The new life that we have in Christ Jesus. So the title of the sermon today is New Life. Okay, not, not pretty original, right? New Life. Um, first, I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. The Bible reads, uh, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, pay attention to these words, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what I want you to notice in that verse is that you are made up of three parts. Your body, your soul, and your spirit. There are three parts that make up that one man. And this topic of the new life or the new creature, the new man, um, I, this is one of my favorite topics to preach on. Um, if you were there for the Soul Winning Marathon back in 2000, what was it, 2016 it might have been. I can't remember when I first came up here. I preached on the flesh versus the spirit. And I love preaching on this topic. I haven't preached it yet in this church. When I preached up in Canada uh, earlier this year, I preached on this topic as well. But I love preaching on it because it is such a simple doctrine. It is such a simple topic. And yet, for whatever reason, Christians tend to forget about it. Christians tend to forget that there's this new man and there's this old man. There's this new life and this old life when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's this carnal man and there's this spirit, this new spirit. And when you read the Bible, you must keep this in mind. You must remember that sometimes the Bible addresses the new man, sometimes it addresses the old man. These things are very simple concepts, and yet people forget it time and time again. Preaching after preaching, they forget it, they forget it, and before you know it, people in the church are doubting their salvation because they've read about the new man, they've read about the wonderful things of the new man, and then they look at their own life and go, well, I fall short of that. Am I really saved? And they start doubting their salvation. And so it's such an important topic just to, you know, reinforce the assurance of salvation that you can never lose your salvation and have a confidence that you have that new man and also understand that there's the old man that you battle with for the rest of your life. And then also to be able to approach the Bible and read the Bible and not get confused. But it's such a simple thing that people tend to forget. And I don't know what that, why that is. Either people just are ignorant of this. Maybe they think... You know, you need to fix the old man to be saved and, you know, the works and repenting your sins and all that kind of stuff. That's another reason, you know, works-based salvation. But there's probably many reasons why people don't understand this basic concept. So, the new man, the new life. The new life is what I'll be preaching about today. Now, notice in those verses, there are three key things there. The body, the soul, and the spirit. Okay? Now, why the body? Why do we have that physical body? Well, basically, it's because we live in a physical, physical three-dimensional, tangible world. We need a physical body to operate in this world, right? I need to be able to speak to you. I need to be able to shake your hand. We need to be able to interact one, one, one another, go to work. We need a physical body to interact with this physical world. That's very basic. You know, that's, that's well understood. But what I want you to understand, and again, very simple thing, is that this body will not last forever. Okay, this body will die. This body decays. 
Okay, this body will get illnesses and sicknesses and deteriorate, and there's nothing you can do about it unless it's God's will to fix things here and there. But ultimately, it's a downward spiral as far as this physical body is concerned, and it's not eternal. I'll just read to you James 4.14, which says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. I mean, it's, it's, sort of not, it's not very encouraging to think that your life is but a vapor. It's just, just a little vapor, a little bit of steam. That's here a moment, you see it, and then it vanishes away. That's, in reality, in, in, next to eternity, you know, that is what this physical our life is. Just this vapor that's here a moment and goes away. Okay? So, this life, this physical body is not eternal. Another important thing that you must understand about this physical body is that this physical body cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You will not go to heaven in this physical body. The physical body you're dressed in right now, you will not go into the kingdom of God. I'll just read to you 1 Corinthians 15, 50, that says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, that's what, you've, what you're wearing right now, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption, because your body's corrupted, inherit incorruption, because heaven is incorruptible. Okay? Our bodies are corrupted. Okay? You don't want to be in heaven in, these, in, these, in this body because you're going to mess up the place, which is incorruptible. Okay? Now, unfortunately, every other religion except biblical Christianity says you've got to take this corrupted body and clean it up and do the works and do the best you can in this body in order to obtain heaven. No, this body's, in, this body's corruptible. You will never clean up this body you know, all the sins that you've committed, you've got the sinful nature in you. It's all been done in this flesh. It's all been done in this flesh and blood. And that's why you will not inherit the kingdom of God. The other thing that you need to understand about this physical body is that there are no second chances. Hebrews 9.27 9, says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Okay, after this, the judgment. There's one death, there's no reincarnation, you don't come back to this life and try again, once this body dies, that's it. It's judgment, God will judge you whether you um, obtained heaven or whether you have obtained hell and you're paying for your sins in hell forever. Okay, there's this one chance. And uh, you know, a lot of people around here, I don't know why they've accepted Eastern, you know, New Age religion. A lot of people think they're going to be reincarnated. They think they're coming back and again and again and again until they reach some level of perfection and then they might make it to heaven or whatever it is. Okay, some people have some wild ideas here. It's not something that you just see in, in Asia anymore. It's here. It's here on the Sunshine Coast. People believe there's many chances to life. There's many chances to life. That's not true according to the Bible. The next thing that you need to understand is our spirit. We have a spirit in us, okay? Uh, we all have it. Uh, if you're saved, you have a living spirit. But first of all, when we talk about the unbelieving world, the unsaved out there, they also have a spirit, but that spirit is dead. The unbelievers are spiritually dead. Why do we need a living spirit? Why is it that when we're saved, we're born of the spirit and we have a revived spirit? Well, it's just like having that physical body that allows us to interact in the physical realm. When you're made alive spiritually, guess what? You can now interact in the spiritual realm of the kingdom of God. You can now pray to the Father. You can now have the Holy Spirit uh, uh, move you and, and guide you in your life. You can interact in that spiritual world with our Heavenly Father through that new spirit that is put in, into us, okay? But everyone, everyone's got a spirit. It's just, it's either dead or it's alive, and it's alive if you've been saved. And I'll just quickly read to you. You can turn there, actually, if you want. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Because this passage is really, really interesting. I, I find it really... You know, I used to read this as, as a child and not understand what was going on. But Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 9. Romans chapter 7, verse 9. Says, uh, this is, you know, obviously Paul writing, For I was alive... For I was alive without the law once. So it's saying, I was once alive. And you're thinking, well, Paul, you are alive. You're, you're writing this letter. You're sending this letter to the Roman Christians. But he's saying, look, I was alive once. What does that mean? But when the commandment came, the commandment of the law, the law of God, sin revived and I died. So when he became aware of the law of God, when he understood the commandments of the Lord, when he understood that he had sinned against the Lord, he says that sin revived and I died. Was he really dead though? Physically? How did he die? 
If he didn't die physically, obviously he's writing this letter, how did he die when sin revived in him? It was a spiritual death. He died spiritually. Okay, look at verse 10. Uh, and the commandment which was... Sorry, I just read that, didn't I? Uh, verse, verse 11. Did I read that? No, I didn't read verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Verse 11. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So it's not the commandments of God. It's not the law of God that kills you. It's the sin in you. When you understand that, that you've sinned against the Lord God, that's what kills you spiritually. And every unbeliever, you know, just generally speaking, I'm not talking about newborn babies here, you know, little children. I'm just saying every unbeliever in general has gotten to a point when they've realized I've sinned against God, sin has revived in them, and it's slew them. It, it's killed them, killed them spiritually, okay? And by the way, this is why we believe, well, I mean, I can give you many references, but this is one key reason why we believe little children, little babies, you know, or, or aborted children or whatever, uh, or people that just die in miscarriage, little babies, go to heaven, okay? Because they haven't had the chance there to be able to understand the law, the commandments of God. They haven't had the chance for sin to revive in them and have that understanding and for that to kill them spiritually. So they go into heaven, and there's many references. One day I'll probably preach on this topic, why little children go to heaven. But this is obviously where you get to a point of understanding what that point is exactly. You know, is it an age? Is it, is it, a, is it a level of maturity? I think it's a level of maturity, a level of understanding. Because I also throw, like, you know, people that are kind of mentally um, disabled, you know, a lot, of, a lot of adults have the minds of little children, and they just can't comprehend many of these truths. I personally think these people also, if they die, they go to heaven because their, their mind, you know, mentally, they're just little children. So when we understand we've broken God's laws, we die spiritually. Now, if you can turn to Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, let's just quickly read about Adam and Eve because obviously the reason why we have this sin nature in us, the reason why we have this fallen nature is because of our great, 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 great grandparents, you know, all the way up to Adam and Eve. You know, we're all, we're all of one blood, by the way. We're all related somehow, all the way to Adam and Eve. But in Genesis 2.16, Genesis 2.16, Genesis 2.16, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now God is a God that cannot lie. And he says, when you eat of that fruit, you, on that day, that same day, you will surely die. Now, did Adam and Eve die? If you guys know the story. Did they die physically? No, they didn't die physically. Obviously, they lived for many hundreds of years later and had many, many children and Cain and Abel and all that, Seth. Uh, but they died. How did they die? They died spiritually. It's the same teaching that we saw from Paul in Romans chapter 7. Now, God has to fix this. You know, this physical body is going to die at some point. That spiritual body, that spirit, that spirit in you has already died if you're an, of an age of understanding that you're a sinner, you've broken God's laws. God has to fix that, okay? And, and, and God will, you know, when you're saved, He gives you that new spirit, okay? If you're saved, you have that new spirit right now, but you don't have that new body right now. That comes at the resurrection. That comes at the rapture. God promises us that new spirit and also that new body. But we know there's a third part of man, well, that third party is what? The soul. The soul. You know, God never promises us a new soul. The soul you have today is the same soul that you will carry into eternity. Okay? So if we get a new body and we get a new spirit, when you think about it then, it's the soul that needs to be saved. It's the soul that needs to be saved. How is it saved? By getting that new spirit and ultimately that new body. Okay? Now, that's why we call it soul winning. That's why when you go and knock doors and preach the gospel and get people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, call upon the name of the Lord, we call that soul winning because really we are winning that soul. Okay? Now, I'll just read to you very quickly a few passages here. Um, I'll just read to you Hebrews 10.39. It says, But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You're going to read a lot in the Bible about the soul being saved. And a lot of that's also found in the book of Psalms. I'll just read a couple of passages. I'll just read one passage uh, to you. Psalm 86, 12 says, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, 
and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So it's the soul that needs to be saved. We can say, yep, the spirit is saved, or we can say the body will be saved at the, at the rapture, but really, it's not really so much being saved, it's actually a brand new one that's coming your way. And you can, you can say that it's saved, you can say that as well, but it's really that soul that never changes, that's the part of you that will never change, and that soul needs to be saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's move on to, let's move on to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 verse 1. John chapter 3, if you can turn there, John chapter 3 verse 1. And John 3, obviously, John chapter 3 has the most famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3, 16. But don't just fixate on that. The whole chapter is amazing. The whole chapter is important. And uh, let's start reading from verse number 1. Because let's talk about now being born of the flesh and being born of the Spirit. And if you're born of the Spirit, that's the new life that we talk about. That's the new life that you have. John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, this is really interesting, just a side note, that the Pharisees, Nicodemus being one of these Pharisees, who gets saved later on, we read about him later, but the Pharisees in general knew that Jesus was sent by God. And if you read the Bible, you know that the Pharisees are still rejecting Christ. They know he came from God, and yet they still reject him. It's, it's amazing. Like, you know, thankfully, there are people like Nicodemus, there are people like Paul that were Pharisees that still, you know, no, I'm not so prideful, I'm going to accept you know, Jesus Christ as my Savior. Uh, verse number three, Jesus uh, answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, verily means truly, 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 this is a true saying, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So obviously he's been born of his mother, and we've all been born, born from our mothers, thank, thank God for mothers. But, you know, Nicodemus, maybe, maybe having a laugh or, I don't know, just being totally stupid, thinks, how do I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? Okay, that's just crazy. Obviously, that's crazy. And I love how Jesus responds, verse 5. Jesus answered, yeah, verily, verily, truly, truly, you've got to be born again. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, we already saw that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we must be born again. We must have new life in order to achieve that. In order for us to see the kingdom of God, in order for us to enter into the kingdom of God, we must be born again. We must have that new life. Okay? But it, Jesus says, look, you need to be born of water and of the Spirit. Right? Verse number five. Now, some people mess this up and think, well, water there must mean baptism. You must be born of water. You must be baptized and come out of the water. And that's, that's what you need in order to be saved. But now you're adding works to salvation. And I don't know why. I mean, it's, just, it's like people that just believe in false things, in, in a false gospel, will just find anything to prove their case. I mean, where, I mean, look, Jesus, God is not a God of confusion. If baptism was necessary for salvation, he would say, except a man be baptized. Okay? He wouldn't just say born of water and just, you know. Well, he, and look, the other thing about this is verse number six answers that question. Jesus, you know, goes another, uh, takes another step and explains what it means to be born of water. We don't need to wonder about it. I don't need to give you my opinion because verse number six makes it very clear what it means to be born of water. Verse number six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus says you need to be born of the, born of the flesh and of the spirit. In verse number five, born of water and born of the spirit. So what is he equating being born of water as? Being born of the flesh. Okay? So in order for us to see the kingdom of God, in order for us to get to heaven, we must obviously be born from our mothers. Now you might say, well, why would Jesus say that? Well, because Nicodemus just addressed it. Do I, you know, do I need to go back into my mother's womb? So, of course, you need to be born into this world. You must be a human being, right? You must be someone that's alive. And, and then you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. You must have that new life in order for you to see and enter that kingdom of God. Okay? And you would say, well, why water? It's, be, it's because, you know, we've got two pregnant ladies here. You know, your babies that are growing inside of you, they're, they're covered in water. They're covered in the amniotic fluid, which is like 99% water. 
something like that, okay? Uh, and so obviously when your waters break, you know the baby's on its way. You know, it, it's the scariest time of my life when Christina says to me, my waters are broken. You know, it's like, oh, what do we do? Like, we start to panic. Obviously, we know what we need to do. And, you know, this is baby number 10 that's coming on our way. But I'm still going to panic. It's still going to happen when the waters break. It's like, oh, no, what, what, what are we going to do? You know, if we have the kids at home, what are we going to do with them? Or whatever, you know. So normally, normally Christina's pretty sure it's coming. And then we, we dump the kids somewhere. And then we just wait, you know, last minute to get to... We, we don't like to get to the hospital early. Because the, the midwives and doctors make you, like, so worried. And it's like, oh, man, maybe cesarean. I mean, how many times have you been told you need a cesarean? Twice, twice enough, and even that they, they were getting her ready, and they had to put a little cap on your your hair, and it's like no, then the baby came naturally. You know, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but yeah, that's why we don't like to go to hospitals too early, is because they get tired of you. They want that bed for someone else. It's like oh well, you need a cesarean, you know. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, being born of, of water is that amniotic fluid that get, that gets broke. You know, the waters have broken, and the baby's delivered. And obviously, when that baby grows. That, ba- that spirit of the baby will, will die, and then it needs to be saved. It needs to be born again. And obviously, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus addresses what it means to be born of the Spirit, is to believe on him, the, the Son of God, who was sent by the Father. Okay? So, please turn now to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. So, if you know you're saved today, can I just see a show of hands? If you know you're saved today, let me see a show of hands. All right. So, everyone that's put their hand up, that means you've been born of water and you've been born of the Spirit. You've been born of flesh and you've been born of the Spirit. Okay, you have uh, the flesh and you have the new life. You have that Spirit in you. Okay? Now, when you read 1 John chapter 1, actually, no, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, just a couple of chapters over. 1 John chapter 3, and let's read verse 9. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Now, if you, all of you that have put your hand up, you know, and you say you're saved, let's read verse number 9. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. This is talking about you. It says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So I'm looking at you guys that put your hands up. You're saying you've been born of God, you've been born again, you have the new life. Well, according to the Bible here, it says you don't commit sin. And if you've committed sin, it's because you're not born of God. Can you say that? Can you say in your life right now, since I've believed on Christ, I've never sinned in my life? Let me see a show of hands if you can say that. That's it? Whoa. Are you serious? (laughs) You've never sinned since you've been saved? (laughs) <laughs> well, that's a true statement. That's a true statement. You have not sinned since you've been saved. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to confuse you on purpose, but I want these things to be clear. What part of you has not sinned? Look at it again in verse number nine. Uh, verse number, yeah, nine. First John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God. Was your flesh born of God or was it born of, of mum? Was it born of Adam? Your flesh is the son of Adam. It's got the sin nature. But the part of you, that new life, that new man, that new spirit in you, was born of God. And that new man in you never sins, according to the Bible. Why does it never sin? Because the seed of God, it says, for his seed, the seed of God, remaineth in him. There's a part of you in this new man that is made up of the same, I don't know if DNA is the right word, probably not, but of God. It's the same seed of God. And if God cannot sin, that means that new man in you does not sin. Okay? You have a part of you that does not sin. Which means when you do sin, it's not the new man sinning. When you do sin, it's still that old flesh. It's still that old man. It's still that corrupted nature of you, that physical nature that will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse, uh, chapter 1. Go, go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Same book, right? Same writer, John, writing the same thing, just two chapters earlier. Verse 8. If we say, and uh, Matthias and Sebastian, these were you guys, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
How do you, how do you like that? <laughs> the truth is not in you. Verse number 9. But look, verse number 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's a part of you that never sins and there's a part of you that you can't say you never sin. That's why you were honest the first time when you didn't put your hands up. You do sin, okay? But when you sin, it's in the flesh. It's in that old man. And that old man can break fellowship with God, which is why you need to confess your sins on a regular basis to maintain that fellowship with God. But even when you sin in that old man, that new man never sins. That new man remains pure. Does that make sense? That new man in you is not what sins. This is why the Bible says we need to walk in the Spirit and not walk after the flesh. You have a choice to make in your spiritual life. Am I going to walk in that old life of mine or am I going to walk in the new life? And all of us, including me, have made decisions to walk after that old man. Okay? And, and then at other times we made decisions to walk in the Spirit. This is a constant battle that you'll have for the rest of your life. Is Samuel falling asleep? I need, I need a little kid. All right, uh, I'll get Emmy. Isabel, can you bring me Emmy? I want to illustrate this to you, okay? So bring me Emmy. Let's pretend em Emilia's a little baby. I was going to use Samuel, but we'll let him sleep. All right, just, just hold Emmy here and then pass it to me when I, when I ask you. So let's pretend this pulpit is, is that, uh, that line of you believing on Jesus Christ and being saved. Okay, but over here, this is the unsaved realm. This is unsaved Kevin. You know, I'm a non-believer. I'm just living for myself. I don't care about the things of God. You know, I'm, I'm probably a, a pretty good guy in the world standard, but still, I'm not saved. I'm completely the old man, okay? Um, and then when I cross this line, this is when someone's given me the gospel. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I cross this line, and I get saved, okay? And I'm born of the Spirit, Okay? So this is what happens. This is what happens. And I want to illustrate this so you understand. Here, here am I in my old flesh. I have the dead spirit. You know, I'm, I'm sinning. I don't care about the things of God. I'm not pleasing God. Even my righteousness, even the things that I do, are like filthy rags next to God. Okay? But then someone comes, you know, Matthew comes and gives me the gospel door to door. Wow, that's awesome. That's wonderful. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I make that decision to believe. I call upon the name of the Lord and I cross here. And then when I cross here, I have the new man or the new little one, right? You know, there's a, I'm, I, look, when I've crossed, I still have the old man. It's still here, the old man. But when I've crossed, I've also got the babe in Christ, the babe in Christ in me, okay? So now, now that I've got two natures, I can decide, you know, do I live after that flesh? Do I live in that old life, that old man? Or do I make the decision to live in the new life? Now, I could, because I've still got that old man here on this side, I'm saved, I believe on Christ, you know, I could continue in the same sins that I did before I was saved, because I've still got that old flesh. In fact, I could even be worse. Because listen, I got saved when I was four years old. And I promise you, I did more sins after I got saved, after I was four, than before I was four. You know, I can't give you a testimony that before I was, I was four, old, four years old, I was this drug dealer, stealing cars and, and robbing banks and, and breaking into people's houses. I can't give you that testimony. But when I got saved, my life changed and I'm no longer doing those things. No. I can't give you. In fact, after I got saved, I committed even greater sins, right? Because I grew up and I started to rebel against authority and all those things. But no matter what kind of sins I do in this flesh, it's in this flesh and the baby in Christ remains sinless. It's perfect, okay? And I, I have to decide, am I going to walk after the Spirit? Am I going to nurture this new man in me? Go to church, do Bible reading, and the more we nurture the new man, this new man will grow and mature. Okay? And ultimately, the goal of your life, this new life that you have, is for this new man, this baby in Christ, to mature and get, get to a point where it is stronger than the flesh. The flesh will be subject to the new man, and the new man has desires of God. The new man never sins. The new man wants to know more about the Lord and read the Bible and go to church and serve the Lord and win souls. But the old man, the old man wants to please me. The old man wants to please myself. The old man wants to sin. The old man wants nothing to do with God. 
Okay? But when you believe on Jesus Christ, you have this dual nature in you. Okay? And this is a constant battle. Who's going to win? Right now, well, you know, the new man's a babe in Christ, probably the old flesh is going to win a lot of the battles, right? And that's why this babe in Christ needs to grow. You know, read the Bible, go to church, and do all those kind of things. All right. I'm going to put a... <clears throat> Now, that should, be, that should be easy to understand, okay? But, but here's, here's what a lot of churches teach, okay? You've got the old man, I'm, I'm sinning, you know, I'm living for myself, I believed on Christ, woohoo, I'm the new man now! The old man's over there, I'm, the old man doesn't exist anymore, now I'm the new man, and I don't sin anymore, and I'm always going to serve the Lord, and I'm always going to praise Him, and I'm never going to do those old sins that I did before I was saved. And then what happens? You do those old sins that you did before you were saved. And I'm not in, did I lose my salvation? Was I ever saved? Who knows? Well, that's, you know, that's crazy. And this is such an easy concept. And yet how many people you know and how many churches have you heard preaching like this? That as soon as you're saved, now you're the new man. And if you're back doing those old things, you were never saved to begin with. Or you lost your salvation or whatever. You know? And, and so what is it then? What is it that, that makes you cross this line? Is it believing on Christ? No, for them, it's you've got to clean your life up, you've got to repent from all your sins, you've got to try to have new desires and whatever to be saved. Instead of thinking, no, those new desires come later, that new life comes later because there's a baby in Christ that's just been born of the Spirit that never sins. So be aware of this because a lot of people just do not understand this simple concept. Now let's talk about losing your salvation. You know, can we lose our salvation? Um, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave Emmy alone. She looks tired. But look, when you have this dual nature, you have the old man, you have the new man, you have the new life, obviously you need to make a decision, do I serve the flesh, do I serve the old man, or do I try to you know, live after the spirit, this new man that I have in me? Now, think about this. People say, if you, you, know, if you continue a life of sin, if you continue in sin, in, in a life of sin, in, uh, what's the other word they use, uh, habitual sin, then you could potentially lose your salvation. Well, first of all, think about it. Does flesh and blood, will your flesh and blood ever inherit eternal life? Will it inherit the kingdom of God? No, it won't. This flesh and blood will not. Okay? And all the sins that I do are in this fleshly body, this sin nature that I have. And then, so if you're turning around saying, well, if you continue a life of sin, you know, either you weren't saved or you can lose it, okay? Well, that's not true because you can't lose something you never had. This flesh, this body was never going to inherit the kingdom of God. So if this flesh and blood continues in sin, it cannot lose salvation because it never had salvation. Does that make sense? You can't lose something you never had. But when you have the new man, you know, when I was holding Amelia there, the new babe in Christ that never sins, well, even when I sin, it's done in the flesh, and that new man remains untainted, remains without sin, so the new man can never lose salvation. The new man will inherit the kingdom of God because it enters into the kingdom of God perfect in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, Losing your, if you understand this concept, the flesh and the spirit, the new man, the old man, the new life, if you will you, will, you will never think you can lose your salvation because you understand all the sins that you commit are in that old man, okay, in that flesh. That was never saved in anyway. It was never going to enter the kingdom of God anyway. Galatians 5. Please turn to Galatians 5.16. Galatians 5.16. I better hurry up. Galatians 5.16. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what does that mean? If you don't walk in the Spirit, what are you going to do? You're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay? So when you sin in your life, you are, um, uh, you are committing, or you are fulfilling the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. 
which is why we're commanded to walk in the Spirit. Because when you're doing spiritual things, when you're going to church, when you're reading your Bible, when you're doing the soul, when, in, when you're praying to the Lord, whatever spiritual activity you take, or even doesn't even have to be a spiritual activity. It can be just your workplace, but you have the mindset that I'm serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're doing it in the Spirit rather than in the flesh, then you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And when you have that, that, that desire, that temptation to sin, you need to make a decision. Am I going to fulfill the lust of the flesh? Am I going to go after that old man? Or am I going to live the new life and overcome that sin, overcome that temptation, and ask God, God, please deliver me from this temptation so I don't walk after the flesh. But even if you do walk after the flesh, that new man remains sinless, perfect. Okay? I'll skip some of my notes here. But... Uh, Actually, no, this is important. I'll just read this to you quickly. In Gal you're in Galatians, right? So turn to the next chapter, Galatians 6, verse 7. Galatians 6, verse 7. The Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap, reap life everlasting. So you have a choice in your life. Am I going to sow? It's like sowing, like going to a farm and sowing seed. You know, if you sow seeds of corn, you're going to get corn that grows. If you sow seed of wheat, wheat's going to grow. Okay, it's not one or the other. If you're sowing to your flesh, if you're giving in to your carnal desires, if you're just satisfying yourself and not thinking about the things of God, that Spirit will not grow. Okay, it will remain a babe in Christ and will be stunted in its growth. But if you want to grow spiritually, you've got to sow to the Spirit. You've got to sow to that life everlasting that we used to read about there. And that will uh, strengthen you in the Spirit. And when you have a stronger Spirit than the flesh, it will be easier for you to overcome sins in your life. Okay? It's not in the middle. You're either sowing to the flesh or you're sowing to the Spirit. And you need to make that decision every day every morning that you wake up. That's why I encourage you to just start your day in prayer. Start your day with the Lord and just try to get in the Spirit, okay? Because that old man's always there. That old man's always going to be going and knocking on you door. hey, remember me? Hey, let's, let's do something that we like to do, right? Let's go do some of the things that we used to enjoy doing before we were saved. So be mindful. Be mindful. Make sure you sow to the Spirit. And uh, let's, look at, uh, let's look at this new life. I'll, I'll skip some of my notes there. Let's look at this new life. What is it? What, what's so great about this new life? Okay, this new life that you have. The first, there's a few. The four things that I want to talk to you about. Um, if you can turn to Psalms, Psalm 73, please turn to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, verse 25. Psalm 73, verse 25. So this new life has new desires. It doesn't have the desires that you had in the flesh as the old man. The new man has new desires. Psalm 73, verse 25. It says, whom have, whom have I in heaven but thee? Speaking of God. And there is none upon earth that I, des that I desire beside thee. The, new des the desires of the new life, of the new man, is a desire for God. You have a desire to, have, to know Him, to, to want to fellowship with Him. Look, it says, and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. I mean, think about just your own personal life. Who do you desire the most in your life? You know, is it your spouse? Is it your children? Now, you should desire them. But who do you desire above them? Do you desire God above them? You know, the new man will desire God above anybody in this earth. You know, your own life, your life of your loved ones, you're going to want to love and please God above all. And let me tell you, when you have a desire for God and, and, and um, of who He is, then your love and desire for your family is going to grow anyway. You know, your love for your wife is going to grow. Your, your relationship with, with her is going to grow. Or your, or your husband and your children. That's going to develop because you have, you've set God first in your life. Okay? Uh, turn to uh, Psalm 37 verse 4. Psalm 37 verse 4. So, it's not just a desire for God that the new life has but also the desires of God, the desires of God. Psalm 37, verse 4. It says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Do you have desires in your heart that you want? Well, the Bible says, If you delight in the Lord, 
He will give you those desires of your heart. And you might be thinking, what? Am I going to get whatever I want? I mean, I have a lot of desires, Kevin. You know, I've got the desire for a Lamborghini or whatever. If I delight in the Lord, is He going to give me that Lamborghini? Well, no. You know, the, 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 the new life has desires of God. Because here's what you're going to find. When you delight yourself in the Lord, when you desire God above anybody that you have in this earth, your desires are going to change. Your desires are going to be the desires of God. Your will will line up with the will of God. And your your focus will change. The things that you desire in that old man, you will no longer desire. In the new man, you desire new things. You desire the things that God wants in your life. And God will give you those desires of your heart. Okay? And look, you'll, you'll never be more happy in your life, you'll never be more satisfied when you seek God first in your life, when you seek His will and His desires, because then God will give you all those things, and you'll be satisfied, you'll be happy. But if you continue after the desires of the flesh, you're saying, God, why aren't you giving me all those desires of the flesh? You, you'll never be happy or satisfied in your life. You're always going to be upset, and you're always going to um, you know, be like, God, why aren't you giving me what I want? Well, you, you need to have the desires of God, not just the desire of God, but the more you know Him, you will have the desires of God. Um, Psalm 19, turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 9. You will have a desire for the Word of God, a desire for the Bible, a desire for the Scriptures. Psalm 19, verse 9. The new life has a desire for the Word of God. Psalm 19, verse 9. You know, we know this one because we've been singing it, you know, every so often. <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord. What are the judgments? That's where we find it in the Word of God. But you know, this, this whole chapter is about the Word of God and desiring it. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. I mean... Do you desire the Word of God more than finances? I tell you what, the new man does, but the old man doesn't. (laughs) The old man wants the finances. The old man wants the honey, you know, the sweet tooth, that kind of stuff. That's the old man, more than the Word of God. But the new man is hungry for the Word of God. I don't know, have you ever gone a time where you've not read the Bible, you've not picked it up for a number of days, maybe a number of weeks, maybe even a number of months, and then all of a sudden you have this strong desire to read it and you pick up the Bible and you read it again, you read it and you spend half an hour reading it, you spend an hour reading it and you can't get enough of it and then you want to hear preaching, you want to go to church and and hear the things of God. You know, that's the new man, that's the spirit that's really hungry, that's skinny and saying, feed me, please soul to the spirit because I want to know the things of God. And when you've got, if you've gone through that, it's because the new man has risen up and said, hey, you need to look after me because I have the desire to know the word of God more. I desire that more than any wealth. I desire that more than any food, any of your favorite foods, uh, your Indian, Nepalese, more than that even, Nepalese Indian food, more than any sweet thing that you enjoy to eat, you will find the word of God sweeter than all those things. And the fourth thing that the new life desires the new life desires, please turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 4. Psalm 27, verse 4. Psalm 27, verse 4. The new life desires to be in church with God's people. The new life desires to be in church with God's people. Verse number 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. You know, do you have a desire to be in church? And obviously you're here this morning, I know you have that desire to be in church. And that's the new man speaking. That's the new life saying, hey, I want to be in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. All the days of my life, really? All the days, that's the new man. The part that says, really? That's the old man. (laughs) That's the old man. Look, there's never, you know, you should never try to find excuses to not be in church. I mean, of course there are legitimate reasons, okay? You know, we have, you know, the the Michels away because they're on holidays or whatever. Or you might be sick and you have sicknesses and you can't come to church for whatever reasons. You know, of course, but think about it. You know, if you have an excuse not to be in church, just think, does this excuse... You know, would God accept this excuse to not be in church? And if, if you think, no, he won't accept this excuse, then be here. 
And when you're here, the new man, the new life in you will be, will be happy, will be delighted that you're here. The old man will be like, oh man, I wish I stayed in bed or whatever. But that new man will be delighted. You'll be so into that flesh. You'll be walking in the Spirit, okay, and, and, and growing in the Lord, okay? We also have, and I don't need you to turn there, I'll just read to you very quickly, but the new life, the new man has new purpose in life. The old man has no purpose. The old man's purpose is to look after itself, to enjoy uh, the world as much as possible before it, it dies or passes away. There's, there's no eternal purpose for that old man. That old man's going to perish. That old man will be six feet under. But the, the new desire, there's a new purpose for that new life. John 20, 21, I'll just read it to you quickly. Jesus speaking to his disciples. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The new life, the new man, has a new purpose. Okay? Now think about it. God the Father sent the Son to do a work. Now would you say that work was important? Of course. You know, he came to save sinners. He came and he died. He sacrificed himself, rose again from the dead. Why did he do that? So he would save souls. Okay? An important mission. I don't think anybody would turn around and say what Jesus Christ did was not important. And yet Jesus Christ says, that same mission that the Father gave me, I now give that to you. As the Father sent me, so send I you. You have a new purpose in this life if you're saved. The new life has an amazing mission. It has the same job that the Father gave the Son. The same job that the Word was manifest in the flesh to accomplish. You have that today. God, Jesus Christ, is sending you out into this world to preach the gospel, to see souls saved. The reason New Life Baptist Church exists is for us to go out into this community and preach that gospel and see souls saved. We've been sent by Jesus Christ. We have an amazing mission. We have a new purpose in our new life. The same mission that Jesus Christ had. I mean, that, that should just be... That should give you just great respect and great honor, a great privilege that you can enter into this same work that was given to Jesus Christ by God the Father. And uh, let me just, uh, oh, I'm almost done here. I'll just read to you, I'll just read the references to you. The new, the new life also has new vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law Happy is he. Now, do we need to keep the Lord to be saved? No. But if we want to walk in the Spirit, we, need to, we ought to try to keep the law. And if we, try to, if we keep the laws of God, the commandments of God, the Bible says, happy is he. This is the vision of the new life. It's for us, to, even, even in this life, even with the struggles of the old man, that we would seek to keep the commands and laws of God. And that's what's going to give you happiness in your life. This is the new vision that you ought to have in your life. I don't want to be just living for myself anymore. I want to live for God. I want to please Him. And what's great about the new, the new vision, the new purpose, is that whatever you do in the Spirit, whatever you do serving the Lord, the Lord will reward you greatly in heaven. The new heavenly rewards for all eternity that you know, you'll never lose. It's there forever. Remember, this life is a vapor. Are you going to use this vapor to earn those eternal rewards? We should do. Because that vapor is going to be gone and you're going to look back at life on this earth and go, man, I wish I did more for the Lord. Okay? We have a new vision. 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, Wherefore, hence more, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are I become new. Okay, you have a new vision in this new life. In this new life, in the new man, all things have become new. Okay? Um, in my, in my, one of my old churches, um, there was, a, there was a, 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 a man that got up to preach and he had a South American background. And um, so he, English was, was his second language and the way he pronounced things were a bit weird. But I remember him reading this passage in verse 17 and he read it like this. And I was just listening. I, was, I hadn't turned this. So I wasn't sure what he was reading from. He goes, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Instead of old things, it sounded like... Because Spanish speakers have, a tr have difficulty with th, th, saying th. And so instead of old things, he was saying old sins. 
Old sins are passed away. I'm going, yeah, okay, yeah, old sins are passed away. But then he read, behold, all sins are become new. I'm saying, what? All sins are new? <laughs> but, you know, in that new man, yes, you've overcome all the sins. That new man will never sin again. But when we read about this new creature, we're not talking about a reformed old man. We're talking about that new man that's in you. That new man, all things have become new. That new vision, that new creature, serving the Lord and doing the work that he left us to do. You know, the best thing about the new life, the best thing about the new life is that you can't mess it up. You can't mess up the new life. You know, when we buy new toys for the kids sometimes for a birthday or Christmas, I get so disappointed when we buy them toys and then the first day after playing with them, it's broken. It's like, as soon as they pull it, they open it and they play with it, it's broken. That's going to happen when you have a bunch of kids playing with it, right? And it's disappointing. It's like, it's a brand new toy and it's broken already. Or, I don't know, if you start, you know, you think, I'm going to start this project. I'm going to start this new project. Maybe you start it and then you, you leave it. Or, you know, you, you don't end up finishing it, you know. You, you, ru you ruin, you know, your desire for that new project. But, you know, the new life, you can never ruin it. The new life, you can never mess it up. Even if you get saved and, and you're, you know, you're excited, you're a babe in Christ, but then you backslide. You backslide, you go back into the world. You get out of church. You stop caring about the things of God. You start pleasing yourself once again. You start doing all the sins that you used to do and you start destroying your life on this earth. And you start doing all those wicked things, whatever it is. And then you look back and you, and, and, and you see the suffering that you have in this life. Well, the advantage of the new life is that even if you do all those wicked things, that new man is untouched. That new man is still perfect. That new man is still righteous. It probably hasn't matured, but it's still perfect. And no matter how badly you mess up your life or how, how strongly the Lord comes down with his chastisement, you can always just press that reset button and be back in that new life and be back serving the Lord. And whatever you've done in the past, it's serving the Lord. All the rewards that you've earned in your life, serving the Lord, they're still there. They're still eternal. You can switch, turn that switch and you can be back there with the Lord. Just confess those sins to the Lord. Be right with Him. You know, ask the Lord to help you to be back and walking in that spirit. And all of a sudden, you're back in that new man and it's untainted. That new man has no sin. That new man's going to heaven. That new man has rewards and you can be back there immediately, no matter how badly you ruin your life on this earth. That's what's the best thing about the new life. It's, it never, it's never corrupted. It's perfect. And even when you mess up, this is why as Christians, we all, gonna sin, we're all, we all sin. But this is why we, can, we get discouraged. Oh, I've done it again. But we can always go back to the Lord, seek His mercy, seek His forgiveness, and be back on track immediately with Him. Because the, the mercies of the, of, of the Lord are new every morning. Okay, great is his faithfulness. So let me encourage you, if you've been, in, you know, if, you've, if you're backsliding, if, if you've not been walking in the spirit, if you've been not walking in that new life, let me encourage you, hey, press that reset button. Just, Lord, I've messed up again. The Lord knows. Jesus Christ said that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Lord knows your failures. The Lord knows why you, you, you stumble and why you sin, but he's willing to help you to get back on track and you can do it straight away. You don't, it's not like something that you need to work toward. The new man was always there. Okay? Uh, I think that's all I have for you this morning. Let's pray.